Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the course Therapeutic Nutrition. This is the second module that is etiology, clinical features and nutritional management of infection and fevers. In this first lecture, we shall be studying about a most important topic in today's context that is nutritional management of infection. I am Dr. Jaspreet Kaur. Presently working as Assistant Professor in Government College for Girls, Ludhiana, Punjab, affiliated to Punjab University, Chandigarh. And this project is funded by DTX Vyam Prabha, MHRD, New Delhi. In this lecture, we shall explore nutrition care during infections. So, what do we learn in this lecture? We will study what are infections and then we will try to see what are the predisposing factors to infection and then we will try to establish the relationship of nutrition with the infection and then we will see if the, there is any role of nutrients in prevention of infections and lastly we will study what are the nutritional interventions during the infection. So, the role of nutrition in disease prevention and health management is well established. And we also know that the poor nutrition that can lead to ill health, disease and infections. Now, these infections, they are caused by microorganisms, which in turn, they can lead to malnutrition. So, is there any link between these two conditions? Let's explore. There is a close connection between microbes and human. Microbes, they occupy all of our body surfaces, including the skin, gut and the mucous membrane. In fact, our bodies, they contain at least 10 times more bacterial cells than our own human ones. From the moment we are born, microbes, they begin to colonize in our bodies. And each of us, we have a unique set of microbial communities, which are believed to play an important role in digestion. And along with digestion, these microbes, they play another beneficial role. For example, they will synthesize vitamins for us. And then they break down food into absorbable nutrients and they stimulate our immune systems also. So along with some beneficial microorganisms, there are some microbes which have some pathogenic effect on us and they can be divided into five major categories uh, such as viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa and helminths. Now let us define what is infection. When a pathogen gains entry into the body in sufficient amount or multiplies in the body and causes injury at a particular place, we call it infection. The infection may or may not cause illness. There are many persons who do not show any symptoms of disease or illness in spite of being infected. Such persons may be transmitting the pathogen and we call them carriers of the disease. Depending upon the place where the pathogen attacks, different types of illnesses they will occur. For example, if the pathogen enters through the nose or mouth and will multiply and throat, bronchi and lung ailments they will occur. 
if they gain excess uh, through water food or milk they will reach and cause gastrointestinal symptoms such as vomiting nausea cramps diarrhea and if they reach through the skin then boils ulcers inflammations they can occur so it depends upon the area where the infection is affecting who all are predisposed to infection there are host of factors which include many factors like first of all let us see there are medical risk factors here we would come to know from the past medical history for example if they are having some medical condition such as if the person is having diabetes or he has a rheumatic or a congenital heart disease then people who are asthmatic or they are having chronic lung diseases then chronic renal or hepatic diseases down syndrome and premature or underweight infants also they are at risk of getting infection and then uh, the second category of this medical uh, problems could be immunocompromised persons there are people who are immunocompromised because of taking steroids or they are taking some immunosuppressant drugs for example people who are aids patient or they are having some connective tissue disease or they are having some cancer or leukemia and who are taking chemotherapy because uh, he, all these drugs they suppress our immune system and then if the person has some previous infection which has been uh, affecting that person in the say last 6 months or a year for example a recent recovery from a tuberculosis or the person he has jaundice or he has rheumatic fever and then along with that we can also uh, see if the person has undergone some surgical conditions that also predispose a person to the infection for example of some gallstone surgery or some recent surgical procedure which has been done for example some dentistry or uh, some minor injury which has been corrected with the help of surgery and then few people they have medical history of some infection or some other close contact of the infection and they are taking some medical uh, treatment uh, we call it self medication on their own if they are taking and if they are using some blood products for example blood transfusion has been occurred uh, in the family so that can also predispose a person to the infection the second factor that uh, predisposes us to infection is lifestyle in lifestyle we can see uh, what is the food preparation methods and what are the hygienic precautions a person is taking and what is the frequency and the type of meals outside home and uh, then housing and social conditions they are also important determinants and then uh, what is the likelihood of contacting the infections for example people who are uh, living in very crowded areas or where uh, the water uh, uh, portable water is not available such people they are also prone to getting infections and then the sexual behavior of a person uh, for example sexually transmitted diseases or hiv risk uh, it is not very apparent always but they are also important risk factors and then of course smoking alcohol use or drug abuse or something like that and uh, another important factor is tattoos they are also uh, an important factor which could cause infection and then uh, the third thing comes what is the travel history and occupation of a person so uh, if if the person he has gone to places where infection is prevalent uh, he has gone to some high risk areas so or the person is a healthcare provider or he is working in a in an institution where uh, these uh, infectious things they are very actively uh, present so such all these factors we call it occupation hazard so all these uh, things they predispose us to infections now for example in uh, in this covid 19 situation healthcare providers are uh, support system police doctors all of them they are prone to this uh infection of uh, corona just uh, so we call it occupational hazard how do pathogens they reach us 
effect the transmission of microorganisms that occurs with one or more means so let us see first uh, way of uh, microorganisms reaching us could be droplet contact when a person who is suffering from some infectious disease when he coughs or one he sneezes on another person for example uh, now corona virus that spreads through this droplet infection and the other one could be airborne transmission if the microorganism can remain in air for a longer period of time then it could uh, cause airborne transmission we shall be studying it in the next lecture and then uh, the direct physical contact if the person has come direct physical contact by touching uh, the person itself or uh, uh, by touching the contaminated surface for example the in uh, again taking the example of corona virus since the virus is heavier it can stay in the air uh, and it cannot suspend rather it will settle on the surrounding areas or the surfaces and as when someone uh, comes in contact uh, with that surface he will catch that virus and that virus will a uh, virus will reach that healthy person the next uh, way uh, it will reach us could be because of uh, fecal oral transmission now uh, if uh, we are taking uh, infected water or the water supply has got mixed with the sewage system or it has been unhygienically handled by the handlers and it gets uh, mixed with the drinking water or contaminated food raw foods such as the salads cut fruits and vegetables or if the vegetables they are washed with the contaminated water or they have been grown in contaminated water so they are all um, uh, important uh, factors which can uh, allow the pathogens to gain, gain access to us and then transmission that also happens with the uh, intravenous uh, route that is if the person is a drug user or some blood transfusion has been happened or the organ transplantation has happened where the blood has been um, uh, exchanged so here uh, people they are more prone and lastly it can uh, be reaching us with the help of carriers who can spread infections we already know carriers are the infected persons who do not show any visible symptoms of infection but they continue to spread the infection when they come in contact either it could be direct or indirect with the healthy person so how does infection affect the nutritional status infection no matter how mild it is has adverse effect on the nutritional status nutritional status we all know that refers to a condition of health in which the individual is influenced by the utilization of the nutrients that that uh, how the person utilizes that nutrients that shows or reflects the nutritional status of a person so how does uh, infection influence the utilization of that nutrients they are the deciding factors that what will be the final outcome of the nutritional status let us understand this process the impact of infection is dependent upon many factors associated with either pathogen or the host so let us see what are the factors associated with the pathogen affecting the nutritional status so the first factor is nature of the infection we know different type of pathogens they have a different mechanism of access and they have different sites on which they establish inside the host and therefore they will affect the nutritional status accordingly and then comes what is the severity of the infection we call it virulence virulence of a pathogen it is dependent upon the ability to attach to and penetrate the host and its ability to successfully replicate in the host environment so the stronger the bacteria or virus or whatever the pathogen is the greater the effect it will have on the nutritional status and then comes what is the load of the pathogen that means we call it inoculum 
the inoculum is an important determinant of risk of infection and it plays a significant role in increasing the risk of, risk of infection in some vulnerable groups for example elderly for example if a young or healthy person individual uh, inhales small amount of secretions he may not show any symptom but the same symptoms that will be seen or they will be affecting uh, an adult uh, or an old person more than a younger one and next is the duration of the infection it is an important determinant as the nutritional uh, status that is badly impacted if the duration of illness is uh, increased or uh, it is prolonged because of fever or some other reasons or lack of treatment and lastly most often fever is also accompanied by the infections which has huge impact on a healthy body and uh, it puts immense burden on the uh, on the host we shall be discussing this uh, feature in detail and let us see now what are the determinants of the host body which will show what will be the impact of infection on the host so the first thing is age as we have already discussed that there are some uh, age groups which are more vulnerable for example children for example elderly now also uh, in covid 19 situation they say people who are elderly or people who are younger than 10 years of age they should not step out of their homes unnecessarily why because these people they are more prone to infections and then second uh, uh, factor could be host defense system how strong our defense is to fight the infection and that can be uh, of two types first one is the natural immunity what we have and second is a specific or adaptive defense system that comes after we are exposed to infection or we are inoculated that means we are vaccinated for some infection and then there are some comorbid conditions for example if a person is uh, affecting with a diabetes lung disease renal disease or peripheral vascular disease they are at risk of infection and you must have heard about again diabetes they are getting lot of infections of uh, some skin or some other organs they are more prone to infections and now on also we say corona that affects the people who are having some comorbid conditions like if the person is heart patient or if the person is having diabetes and then some uh, uh, certain medications also they interfere with the activity of the immune cells and the person may not be able to fight the infections for, for example if the person is taking some immunosuppressant things we have already discussed it and then lastly there are few persons who are having some impaired uh, cognition system for example they have some physical changes which has come up for example they have dry mucous membranes because of uh, some disease or uh, uh, some previous infection or because of lower immunity because of some micronutrient deficiency or whatever or uh, some of them may be having reduced gag reflex or cuff reflex has affected so they are important determinants of impact of infection on the nutritional status If you recall, last time when you were unwell or you were down with some kind of infection, what did you experience? Most likely, we first thing we experience that is loss of appetite. We do not feel like eating when we are not feeling well. And the infectious diseases, they increase the circulating intraleukins. They are the substances which are uh, traveling in our blood when there are acute infections and they also lower our appetite and further if we are taking some medic medication for example we are taking antibiotics we are uh, because we are infected to, to in, uh, treat the infection so appetite will be further decreased and in there are uh, some conditions for example in hiv patients they have some mouth ulcers or they have sore throat that also reduces appetite 
and then a person feels very low because of the disease so now if this this is the condition it has been prolonged it would naturally will have a consistent decrease in the food intake and it will lead to the nutrient deficiency one major change that will occur is the person or the family they restrict or withdraw a large amount of food from the individual's plate when he is suffering from infection particularly if the person has diarrhea or he has some respiratory infection it is believed that the solid foods or milk and milk products etc they are to be avoided instead bland starchy gruels which are low in nutritive value they are provided to the patient to give rest to the digestive system now this practice is rather bad particularly when the individual uh, is having so much of infection and he is taking less food and there is reduction in the quality also and that also is going to affect because the nutritional deficiencies they will be more and they will compile infections they cause changes to the epithelial membrane which leads to malabsorption there is poor absorption of the fats proteins carbohydrates and certain fat soluble vitamins for example absorption of macronutrients can be 10 to 30% lower than the healthy person consuming same amount of diet and during respiratory infection it could be 30 to 70% of vitamin a which is absorbed and rest is uh, just excreted out out of the body now poor absorption does this will lead to nutritional deficiency disorders and uh, will influence the nutritional status there are many reports which say that uh, people who are having poor nutritional status they also have some intestinal worms or a parasitic infections inside their bodies for example hookworm roundworm then uh, amoeboids giardias they are some common and most common intestinal parasites infections uh, worldwide these infections they are crucial especially for the children and adolescents as they are associated with the decreased child growth and there is a loss of weight and then chronic blood loss can occur leading to anemia and uh, diarrhea and stunted growth can also happen so it this infestation and deficiencies they are important determinants of nutritional status especially in the children and adolescents then in some infections and fevers few nutrients particularly proteins they are excreted and lost from the body thus causing the poor nutritional status for example diseases which are associated with the diarrhea dysentery they produce an average loss of 0.9 gram protein per kg body weight per day and higher losses they are observed with the typhoid fever or other acute infection which could reach up to 1.2 gram protein per kg body weight per day such losses therefore they contribute to increased requirement of protein during infections and uh, during fever now we have seen that there are there is malabsorption there is poor intake there is restriction and all these factors they increase the dietary requirement of various nutrients and especially if the person is having high fever there will be increase in the basal metabolic rate and uh, in high fever the the requirements may go up to as high as 20 Uh, 50% more than the routine uh, energy requirements if there is more catabolism and the person has to fight infection along with the routine body processes and lastly one important uh, factor that affects the nutritional status with the infection is the drug nutrient interaction now when the person is suffering from some uh, infection doctors they prescribe some anti infective agents they have to give them to control the infection 
now these uh, nutrients they have some kind of uh, interference or you can say they have some kind of effect on the working of the medicine that is the antibiotic and similarly there are antibiotics which will affect the normal working or the normal action of the nutrients inside our body so this interaction also uh, cause some kind of malnutrition some kind of deficiencies so we have to consider all these points uh, to see what is the cumulative effect of uh, infection on the nutritional system there is a close interaction between nutrition and infection now we have seen that uh, we call this relationship synergistic relationship that is the nutritional deficiency lowers resistance to the infection and infection aggravates the existing malnutrition so individuals who are chronically undernourished they are not only prone to infections they get the infection very quickly but also they take longer period to recover than uh, we compare it to the well nourished person that is why we are hearing a lot about uh, working on the uh, immunity these days as we know when there is an inadequate dietary intake weight loss is bound to come and there will be lower resistance to infection mucosal changes they will come and uh, once the mucosal changes they have come the pathogens they will find easier to reach or to gain they get an opportunity to invade our body and this invasion affects us and impairs our growth and development among children and then sick persons nutritional status is further deteriorated due to secondary infections such as diarrhea malabsorption this will again further lower the appetite and there will be diversion of the nutrients for the immune response and there will be urinary loss of nitrogen all these damages the immune system further and cause reduced intake of the food so we call it a vicious circle which is formed that is vicious circle of malnutrition and infection now let us see what are the key nutrients in response to infection the proteins are the most important macronutrients which are required for fighting the infections they are needed for making enzymes for keeping our gastrointestinal tract healthy for adequate immune responses the deficiency of proteins it diminishes the immune response and increases the susceptibility to infection now these immune responses they are dependent upon cell replication or production of protein with the biological activities we call them immunoglobin this malnutrition it has great impact on non specific type of immunity and cell mediated immunity so the protein deficiency will lower the integrity of various cell membranes and these membranes they will have some kind of infections and the person will become more prone to respiratory skin or gut or uh, urinary tract infection fats are second important uh, nutrient when it comes to immunity they play an important role uh, for example omega 3 fatty acids they promote immune function then we have polyunsaturated fatty acids they have protective role whereas saturated fatty acids they promote inflammation so the diet with the right ratio of n3 and n6 fufa they are important determinants of immune system and then if we talk about carbohydrate good amount of carbohydrate that supplies ample energy for our immune system but excess carbohydrate in blood they are a risk factor where neutrophil activity can be lowered because of hyperglycemia vitamins are important nutrients when it comes to immunity so let us uh, talk about the role of vitamins for example vitamin a it maintains the integrity of the epithelial layer especially of respiratory and gastrointestinal tract 
whenever there is deficiency of vitamin A, the phagocyte activity and lysozyme activity that goes down. And then people who have uh, vitamin A level lower than uh, required, they also experience more diarrhea, malaria, measles and high mortality is also seen among children. And uh, risk of respiratory illness that also increases and chronic gut infections they can occur whenever there is vitamin A deficiency. So the next uh, vitamin is vitamin D. It is also known as sunshine vitamin. It is known to have antimicrobial effect and pro-inflammatory cytokines and it improves the gut health also. It is considered as an effective immune booster against tuberculosis also. And uh, whenever there is deficiency of vitamin D, T cells and uh, uh, B cells, their activity is also lowered and the reaction time that increases. Next vitamin is vitamin E, the important fat soluble antioxidant, uh, which is very excellent free radical scavenger. Its deficiency uh, impairs B and T cells mediated immunity and it prevents the oxidation of the cell membranes. So uh, it is very important to maintain the level of vitamin E for uh, having a good immune response. Now let us talk about some B vitamins. So the first B vitamin is B6 or pyridoxin. It is needed for good intestinal immune regulation and for the amino acid synthesis and metabolism. Its deficiency impairs the cytotoxic activity of lymphocytes and antibody production. Next B vitamin is B9 or folate. It has a great role in cytotoxic activity, antibody formation and metabolism and antibody response to the antigen also. Another B complex vitamin is B12. It has a great role in gut microbiota it maintains their good level and it is required for uh, immunomodulation and T cell production. Another one is vitamin C which is a water soluble vitamin which has antioxidant um, effect. It is found in the body fluids. It is important for the phagocytes and improves the WBC action also. Its deficiency decreases the resistance of the tissues to the infection by causing changes in the epithelial cells. For example, it can cause scurvy, it can cause spongy bleeding gums and predisposes the body to infection. So next important determinants of immunity are prebiotics and probiotics. They help to reintroduce and reinforce our immune system. They increase the immune response of our body and they promote specific immune signaling in the body. Along with all these, let us see what is the role of minerals in maintaining the immune system. So, among minerals, zinc, it is also known as gatekeeper of immune function. It has profound effect on the immune cells. Its deficiency reduces non-specific immunity, neutrophils and natural killer cell function. It is also impacted. And its supplementation is done to lower the intensity and uh, length of the diarrheal diseases, especially amongst the children also. And uh, it is known for giving uh, good mucosal immunity. The second mineral is iron. Iron deficiency, we know it is associated with the uh, impairment in the cell mediated immunity and it reduces the neutrophil action also. The third important one is selenium. It is an important part of antioxidant enzymes and it can be a potent immune cell for pro-oxidants by uh, regulating the oxidative Along with all these minerals, we have magnesium. The deficiency of magnesium is very crucial in maintenance of the immunity because it has a great role in maintaining the innate 
and acquired immunity of the body as it boosts the action of our immunoglobin. Now we have seen the effect of various nutrients in preventing and fighting the infections. Let us see how we can provide good nutrition care when a person gets infected with an pathogen. So, as we know, infections can really pose burden on the whole system. We need to provide ample nutrition support to contain the infection. So, let us see what are the general dietary considerations in infections. First thing is energy. We know that the BMR, that is basal metabolic rate, that goes up during infection, especially when a person has fever. Hence, the calorie needs, they are to be increased. And along with the fever, there could be restlessness. That also increases the requirement. The patient uh, may not be able to handle more calories uh, in the initial phase of the infection. So, uh, he can only uh, take around 600 to 1200 kilocalories. But diet can also be improved rapidly uh, when the tolerance improves. And second uh, nutrient is proteins. Since there is protein loss from the body, we have seen in the previous slides, about 100 gram of protein or more is prescribed for the adults when fever is prolonged. The proteins, they get utilized more efficiently when there are a um, sufficient amount of calories and uh, available. So, it is suitable to give high protein beverages as supplement in between meals which are containing good amount of calories. Next comes the carbohydrate. As we know, uh, especially when there are fever associated with the infection, the glycogen reserves, they are depleted. So, uh, liberal intake of carbohydrates may be given. Glucose can be used as, as it is less sweet and it is really uh, nicely absorbed in the bloodstream. The next uh, uh, nutrient would be fats. They are handy because we can meet high energy demands without increasing the bulk of the diet. But uh, here, uh, very fat, uh, rich uh, or fried items, they are to be avoided because they will all, uh, retard the digestion process. And minerals, we have already understood and we have seen ample amount of minerals they are to be provided. Especially uh, sodium and potassium, they are to be provided. Uh, we have not discussed them earlier because uh, why we are uh, mentioning them here? Because sodium and potassium, they are lost once there is infection through the various channels of the body. Maybe it's because of sweat, because of the urine, uh, it, the secretion is more of sodium and uh, potassium. And similarly, we need to provide good amount of iron, zinc, magnesium, selenium to boost the immunity. And uh, then comes vitamins. We, we have just discussed vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin B complex. They are needed. And uh, since there, if there is fever, there are more uh, uh, requirement, the requirement of B complex that is raised because of uh, higher metabolic rate BMR that goes up and we need sufficient amount of fluids to compensate the losses from sweat and urine and then it should be uh, used because it relieves the congestion in case a person has some uh, 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 problem associated with some choking or something like that and it flushes out the toxins and it keeps the membranes intact. And uh, it is advisable that 2.5 to 3 liters of fluid that should be uh, adequate in most of the cases. But if there is dehydration because of some illness such as diarrhea or excessive vomiting, then we have to increase it to maybe 3 to 4 liters in 24 hours. But there are some conditions when the body holds water because of some medicines or because of some infection then water uh, has to be uh, adjusted accordingly. Then we have some herbs, 
condiments and spices they are immune boosters from our kitchen they possess some antiviral properties and they fight many infections and these uh, herbs condiment and spices they have uh, taken a special place in our lives in these days so uh, let us see uh, what kind of diet should be given now let us uh, try to summarize so we need to give bland readily digestible food that should be used for easier digestion and rapid absorption food should be soft and uh, of regular consistency initially we have to give fluid diet because the patient may not be able to take uh, uh, solid foods but it should not be continued for a longer period of time because most of fluids they occupy bulk and they are out of proportion for the amount of calories and nutrients they are providing and we need to reinforce the diet with the solid foods because it will increase the satiety and uh, many people they they feel less anorexic or they feel less nausea or vomiting when they are on solid diet so uh, small frequent meals at uh, an interval of 2 to 3 hours they will provide ample nutrients without burdening the system the frequency can be reduced when the patient is uh, able to uh, tolerate the food and is able to consume large quantities of the food and during the acute fever the appetite is very poor we all know that is why small frequent meals they are desirable and if the illness persists for more than few days then high protein high calorie diet is uh, to be ensured so that the catabolism is contained and nutritional status is restored let's summarize what we have studied in this lecture we studied that when a pathogen gains entry into the body in sufficient numbers or multiplies in the body and causes injury at a particular place we call it infection and then we studied what are the predisposing factor to the infection then we studied what is the synergistic relationship of malnutrition immunity and infection and how a vicious circle of malnutrition and infection is formed and then we studied how infections they impact our uh, nutritional status and then we studied about the role of nutrients in prevention of infections along with we studied that how we go for nutrition care during the infection thank you